You've been introduced to ways to determine the order of reaction and the rate coefficients for a few select cases, zeroth, first, and second order in a single reactant. And while these cases are quite common, there are plenty of other cases where the math can get quite hairy. Fortunately, there is a simple, powerful strategy we can use to take many of these complicated multi-component rate laws and figure them out using just the three common single component rate laws you've already been exposed to. This technique is called the method of flooding or the method of isolation. Here's the idea. Let us suppose that we have some reaction of known stoichiometry, and we suspect that the rate of reaction may depend on all three of the reactants, A, B, and C. Let's further suppose that we are monitoring the reaction by watching the concentration of species A. Now imagine that we set up our experiment with these concentrations. Notice that the initial concentration of A is much smaller than the initial concentrations of either B or C. Now imagine this reaction running to completion. What will the final concentrations be? Well, A is a limiting reagent, so all of that will be used up. But based on the stoichiometry of the reaction, the concentrations of B and C will barely have changed. We have flooded the system with B and C, hence the name of this technique. So what does that mean for our rate law? Well, if the concentrations of B and C haven't changed, then all of this is constant over the course of the reaction. Let's combine that into one constant we will call K observed. But look closely at this expression. We now only have a single species in this new revised rate law, and we know how to handle that. We plot the concentration of A versus time, the natural log of A versus time, and the inverse of A versus time, and see which one is a straight line. We have isolated the rate behavior of species A, hence the other name for this technique. Let's suppose the natural log is the one that works. We now know that the reaction is first order in A. But there is something else we know as well. The slope of the line is negative K observed. This is what we call a pseudo first order rate coefficient. Because it isn't a true rate coefficient, but under these conditions it sure acts like one. But now notice something else. We can choose different flooding values for B or C and still flood the system with them. Let's leave C alone for now, but change how much we flood the system with B. We still get a pseudo first order behavior, but we have a different K observed. Why? Because the value of K observed depends on the concentration of species B. We even have the formula for how it depends on the concentration of species B. So let's make a bunch of measurements at different flooding concentrations of B and plot the results. Let's suppose the data looks something like this. It is pretty clearly linear, going through zero, so that tells us that B has to be 1. Now we repeat the process, holding the concentration of B constant, but varying the concentration of C. In this case, the curve looks quadratic, which you could check by fitting the data. So now we know that C is 2. Now the only thing left to do is to find the true rate coefficient K. But that is a piece of cake, because you have a bunch of different determinations of K observed for different concentrations of B and C. And now that you know the reaction orders, any or all of them can be used to find K. And that is the method of flooding. By controlling your experimental conditions such that only one reactant's concentration changes over the course of the reaction, you are able to fold all of the other concentrations into a pseudo X order rate coefficient, where X could be 0, 1, or 2. You then measure these K-observed values while varying the other concentrations one at a time to find the other reaction orders. Finally, you have an abundance of data to find the value of the true rate coefficient. And you now have a powerful tool in your toolbox to determine quite complicated empirical rate laws. I want to close out this lesson by revisiting an example from our first introduction to reaction rates. You may have noticed in this example that I defined the reaction rate in terms of all of the reactants and two of the products, but I ignored the water. Now that we've talked about the method of flooding, you may be able to understand why I left off the water. Remember, water is the solvent in this reaction. So while some molecules of water are formed over the course of this reaction, the concentration of the water, already much higher than the concentrations of everything else, won't have changed appreciably. This is true for most cases of solvents, as well as for solids that are either reactants or products. Some may react away or be formed, but their concentrations just don't change much, if at all.